So we've gone through the definition of the Laplace transform, and we've discussed uh, various theorems regarding Laplace transforms, uh, the linearity theorem. We've discussed also the um, existence theorem of the Laplace transform and the convergence of the integral. And um, I briefly discussed how Laplace transforms are important to solving differential equations. Before we jump into solving differential equations, with Laplace transforms, we have to discuss one more concept, and that's the inverse Laplace transform. Okay? So definition, if f of s, capital F of s, represents the Laplace transform of the function f of t, that is, we have that relation, we then say that f t is the inverse Laplace transform of capital F s. And we write um, this, okay, where this negative one there does not mean reciprocal, right, but the inverse, okay? So it's exactly what you thought it was, okay? The inverse Laplace transform just goes in reverse. Um, let's look at some examples. So we know, and we've computed that the Laplace transform of 1 is 1 over s. Well, that means the inverse Laplace transform of 1 over s is 1. Uh, likewise, for t, we have the Laplace transform of t is 1 over s squared. So that means the inverse Laplace transform uh, is 1 over s of, of 1 over s squared is t. And um, finally, because we have this Laplace transform, we have that the inverse Laplace transform of uh, the right-hand side is e to the minus 3t. And uh, the way we define those, so the Laplace transform was defined through an integral. And the way the inverse Laplace transform is defined here is just that it's the reverse operation of what the integral would yield, okay, if, if we were applying the Laplace transform. Uh, that does not mean there are no formulas for um, uh, the inverse Laplace transform. Um, for, formulas can be obtained, for example, here. This is a contour integral on, in, in the complex plane, so we'd have to do a line integral on the complex plane from uh, this lower bound to this bound, okay? Or, you know, this point in the complex plane to that point in the complex plane where gamma is uh, suitably defined. Um, you could look more into this. This is Mellon's inverse formula. Uh, there are other inverse formulas, one that take advantage of derivatives and limits of that. Uh, we're not going to talk about these formulas. Okay, so for our purposes, this is what the inverse Laplace transform, we, we don't want to compute it explicitly. We're just going to be working with the, you know, we know how the Laplace transform acts on certain functions, and because we know how it acts on certain functions, we know the reverse. That's how we're approaching this problem. We're not approaching it constructively uh, uh, or, you know, through computing the actual um, Laplace transform through an integral. And so here's a theorem with some of the basic inverse Laplace transforms. You can see here um, some of these we've discussed. Okay, and, and this is just literally taking what we know about the, we, we know what the Laplace transform of sinh kt is, well then because we know that, we know that the inverse Laplace transform of what we would get by the Laplace transform is is um, of of this guy is cinch. Okay, so it's just working in reverse. Looking at some examples, let's look at the inverse Laplace transform of one over s to the fifth. Well, you know, if if you look at the Laplace transform of t to the power n, it looks like this. Okay, so it's not quite in the form of 1 over s to the fifth, right? We have that in factorial. But what do we know about the um, Laplace transform? That it's linear, okay? The inverse Laplace transform is then also linear. Okay, this is this theorem here. And so that means you could pull out constants and um, uh, it commutes with sums and scalar multiplication. So suppose the function f of t is the inverse Laplace transform of capital F of S, and likewise for G, and that they're piecewise continuous functions and of exponential order. 
then for real constants alpha and beta, we have this relation it's just telling you the, of linearity. So what that means for this example here is that we can sort of massage this term to get an n factorial there. How do we do that? Well, we could always multiply by 1. 1 times any number is that number. So uh, 1 is also 4 factorial over 4 factorial, right? That's just 1. So it's not changing anything. What we're going to do there is pull this into here. Okay, and why? Because we know that if this is n plus 1, this has to be n factorial. So if 5 is equal to n plus 1, then n has to be 4. And so we need a 4 factorial in here. Taking advantage of the linearity property, we insert it into the um, inverse Laplace transform. And then we do have this expression from this theorem. Okay, it's just with n equals 4. And so we get t to the fourth there. And we have this 1 over 4 factorial. And uh, there goes the final answer. Uh, what about this guy? 1 over um, s squared plus 7. So you take a look over here. So we got an s squared. So you look for s squared in the denominator. I mean, here's 1, but this has an s on top. Here's another, but this is a minus k squared. So this is what we're looking for, OK? But again, this has 7 and to be in conformity with this formula, we're going to need a square root of 7 there, so that square root of 7 squared is 7. Okay, No problem, we just do that same trick. We get that square root of 7 in there, and then we take the inverse Laplace transform of that from just the formula where k equals square root of 7, and so we know that that's equal to sine square root of 7t. Okay, So that's how you do these problems. Uh, just kind of a quick note here, too. The inverse Laplace transform is, in general, not unique. Okay, So it's, it's really easy to actually take two, you know, two functions that are discontinuous at a point. Okay? Uh, they could be at different points. You know, if, as long as you have that finite amount of discontinuities, uh, then as long as it's discontinuous at a point, the integrals are going to be the same. And so their Laplace transforms will be the same, okay? So in general, inverse Laplace transforms aren't unique. The fact that you could take Laplace transform of different functions and get the same value or the same function shows that, you know, going in reverse is not unique. But if F1 and F2 are continuous, so you don't have those kinds of discontinuities on this interval, then um, if the Laplace transforms are equal, then the functions are equal okay so you have almost uh, uh, almost a unique a uniqueness theorem there okay um, all right so let's look at another example with this example here okay uh, how are we gonna deal with how are we gonna deal with that right how are we gonna deal with that well None of these formulas have like a a s plus b there, right? But we could break this into uh, a sum of fractions, right? You just use the property of a plus b over c is equal to a over c plus b over c, right? Uh, be careful not to do that in reverse, okay? a over b plus c is not the same as a over c plus b over c. You don't do that, but... Um, here we could break this up uh, thusly and you know by the linearity property here you can uh, the, the inverse Laplace transform commutes with sums so this inverse transform of this is the sum of the inverse transforms of these and you could pull out constants because of linearity as well so we pull out a constant from the inverse transform and now we put it, you know, now these two forms do do uh, conform to something in the theorem, okay? Namely, this and this, okay? And uh, because we found that, we, we could write this result there, okay? So let's look at another example. We have this guy here. Again, uh, our theorem doesn't really write this explicitly, but 
what we could do here is recall from calculus 2 the concept of partial fraction decomposition. And again, I don't want to go into this in depth. Uh, you're more than welcome to take a look at the Calc 2 series and, and find partial fraction decomposition in there where we go in much more depth. Uh, here we're focusing on other things, differential equations. Um, but anyway, you know, this has these linear factors down there. And again, how I got this form, please take a look at that video. And we want to set this, write this as equal to this with where A, B, and C are constants. Uh, you know, you multiply both sides by the denominator there, you get this expression. And since this holds for any s, it holds for particular values of s, which could just simplify our work. So we'll choose s equals 1, for example. And, it, you know, when we plug in 1 over here and 1 over here, these two terms have 0. And so you just get an expression with a. And uh, you could then solve for a. You could plug in 2, and you get this expression, solve for b. Plug in negative 4, you get uh, this expression, solve for c. And so we have that this term here may be written this way by partial fraction decomposition. And so when we take the inverse Laplace transform uh, by the linearity property, we get this here, OK? Pulling out the contents, distributing through the sum. And we know the inverse Laplace transform of these. These are exponentials, OK? And we could go up here and take a look. And it, they are in the, this form there, OK? Be mindful that the form here has a um, minus a okay so if you'll notice that s plus 4 is s minus negative 4 and that's why that's a negative 4 there 